day was at the fire station, so was my son. And I was at home with the kids and we knew the fire was getting closer. And, you know, Jaden kept coming to me and saying, Mum, the fires are getting closer. Mum, are you going to move? And I'd say, well, I'm watching it. I'm watching fires near us. And they told us, we don't have to worry until tomorrow. The fires will, you know, probably, if they're coming to Kabargo, get there tomorrow. Jaden said to me, come outside. And I said, what's the noise? And he said, that's the fire and it's really close. You have to go now. So he then helped me shovel everything into the car and I left. You were? At the showground. Yeah. Uh, catering for people who were just milling about. And, and we couldn't get in touch with each other at this yeah. time. I didn't know how Dave was, how Jaden was. Mm. And at about two o'clock in the afternoon, Jay called me. And I knew something was wrong because he was crying and sobbing and crying. And he said, oh, Mum, I tried so hard to save it. I really tried. And I just couldn't. Mm. When we first came to Kabago, we had six children with us. And they were our foster children. Our family fluctuates. Sometimes we have a lot, sometimes we have not very many. And we can't really remember how many because I stopped counting in Canberra and that was just over the 400 mark. Mm. And we've had a lot more since we've been down here. It was a very easy community to get into. We were welcomed with open arms. New Year's Day 2020 was the start of a downward spiral of total loss, extreme uncertainty and serious mental health issues. I couldn't even make cups of teas and coffees. He couldn't function. And uh, all my life I'd been helping people and it got to a point I could no longer do that. In March 2020, we had our first contact with Breathe Architecture of Melbourne. The journey started pretty simply with us writing to the RFS Fire Chief, being introduced to Dave. Dave said to us, there's over 400 people who have lost their houses around here. There must be someone who deserves this more than us. There must be someone who needs help more than us. Why don't you help them? And Madeline responded by saying, well, you've spent your entire life helping other people. They'd fostered dozens and dozens of children, put community service at the front of their entire life. And beyond all that, he was the town Santa. He had a sled that he would drive into town every Christmas. So there is no one else. And Madeline said, Dave, you're a hero and we want to help you. Dave, you know, went quiet and Barbara gave him a big hug and said, you see, you're a hero. <laughs> And it was quite a beautiful moment. And so from that moment on, um, Madeline worked really closely with them to work out what it was they needed to build. They were living in temporary housing with all of their foster children. So they really were just after a home. From a design perspective, this house is incredibly simple and really humble. We wanted to think about the future should another bushfire event occur as well as just deliver a better outcome that's more sustainable. You know, we just couldn't believe that someone we didn't even know who was in Melbourne mm. was going to do this for somebody <laughs> in Little Cavago. And my job was to call everyone I knew and ask for donations. I started by calling Fisher Paykel, asking for a house full of appliances, to which they immediately said yes. And then I called Tormans and asked for paint for the entire house. And of course they said yes. And then I called fielders and asked for steel for the roof and the walls. And then I called BREC Energy and said I need solar for this house. I called Automatic Heating and asked for a heat pump. And then we spoke to Formbrick, Tradelink, Accent Windows, Studio Wall, and they donated as well. And also the builder, Jason, what an incredible young man who committed to get Dave and Barbara back into the house by Christmas. And so it was this incredible team of people that came together 
within a blink of an eye. And then I went back to Maddie and said, here are all the people that are donating these things. How do we design a house with this kit of parts? We were amazed that the architect, Madeline Sewell, drew the plans without seeing the site due to COVID-19 lockdowns. It was amazing that Madeline was able to include the movement of the sun, the layout of the site, and the lay of the land. It was really, really good. It was just something, just something to focus on that was really positive. And this is it. It's simple, it's unegotistical, it's carbon neutral in operation, importantly. And for us, it's one of the projects we're most proud of, despite its incredible humility. So we've got the bedroom side, it has the bathrooms in the bedrooms, and we've got the kitchen, living and dining area. We put a lot of time and effort into considering the environmentally sensitive design components. This house runs on a fossil fuel free system. We've got a hydronic heat pump system with a buffer tank. We designed the house to have a pitched roof to shed embers if another fire event were to occur. The roof also has a sprinkler system installed along the ridge line. Being here for the first time in Cavargo and meeting them and their amazing kids has been a really great experience. And we're incredibly proud of the outcome and everybody's amazing efforts at making it happen. This morning, Dave and I drove into the mountains behind their house. And we saw the devastation of ridge and valley after ridge and valley. He said that the fire burned with such intensity that fire just rolled across the ground and anything that was combustible in the soil was burning. The ground itself was on fire when it hit the house. Dave explained to me that some of these trees will never come back and the vegetation is going to change because some things survived the heat and some didn't. And then he kind of talked to me about this idea that it's like the community in Cabago. Some people have left, they've given up, they've sold their houses and moved out and other people are rebuilding and they're rebuilding better. They're looking at how can they grow and how can they grow differently as a community? That's the saddest part. There's a lot of people out there that are still living in a caravan that still haven't got approval to build a house or they still don't have enough money or they don't have enough help. People still come up to you in the street and they'll be crying and they'll hug you still. There's just large chunks of the town missing that have never been rebuilt. There's been a handful of prefab houses built. There's been a handful of modular houses built. But this is only the second house to be stick built on site. Building prices have gone through the roof because everyone's trying to rebuild. And so people who even were insured, now their insurance won't cover the cost to rebuild what they had because of trade prices. What these people need is help in really practical things. So if you're an architect, please offer your services pro bono to deliver the entire project start to finish. If you're a builder or a tradie, please think about coming down here and doing some work to help deliver some houses. And if you're a supplier like Fielders or Bishop Haykel or Taubman's, think about donating some materials to help bring down the cost of building. There is still so much work to be done here, but it's starting and you can see that people's hope is coming back particularly those who had put their own lives on the line to try and save others and who'd lost everything. It's the best thing you can do to help somebody is to, yeah, come along after mm. such a horrible disaster and help them get their lives together mm. because that's what happened with us and mm. we are just, yeah, there's no way we could ever repay anyone for mm. doing it. No way. <laughs>